And while they're straggling in, because as you know from last night, I'm always trying to squeeze every minute out of our time together. Uh, so while people are you know, arriving, I just wanted to take a moment and ask, uh, what did you find helpful about last night? What was maybe new or surprising, or what was good to hear again? So in other words, what kind of things have been rattling around in your brain since last night? Uh-huh, Fence. Um, something that I, I marked when I was reading through the book but mm -hmm. that you brought sort of together yesterday that we're trying to tie in with our natural family planning is that it affects every part of our life. It affects every part of our life. It's, it's not just this kind of isolated segment. Right. Uh -huh. It's a biological and spiritual. Theological, exactly. Yeah. Bio okay, yeah. good. So I think that's what our students are missing. Uh -huh. They seem to be so concentrated on the biological part that we have to stop and go time out. You have to have the, spir the spiritual part of it to make it really work. Oh, that's, Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense. That's excellent. So you've seen in your natural family planning teacher teaching that because it has to do with the body and, and especially the, biological, the biology of the body, that uh, your, your students kind of they come to the class and that's their focus. Yeah. And you realize it's really important to weave in, integrate in the whole spiritual, theological piece so they see, again, so that they don't themselves split their biology from their, their spirituality or their body from their spirit. Yeah. That's a great observation. I really believe that theology, of the, I'm sorry, that natural family planning is, can be one of those hidden apostolates. I really actually believe it is, I'm so happy you said that, and that it is fertile, and I use that word purposely, it is fertile for the new evangelization. Because again, if we're thinking that the new evangelization is inviting people back to embracing their faith, Anyone know the statistics, how many Catholics use some form of contraception or sterilization? 70, 80 percent. You know, I mean, it's very high, even higher. Yeah, I always like to be a little bit more modest, so probably 80 to 90 percent. <gasps> that means 80 to 90 percent of uh, the married people sitting in those pews need to be re-evangelized. That they are who the new evangelization is about. And so natural family planning or fertility awareness is, I think, such a ripe area for it because it's not obvious at first what your real telos is, which is conversion, deepening our encounter with the living Christ, deepening our understanding of doctrine. Can't, can't you just say, OK, NFP and doctrine, come for this four-week course. How many people would show up? Zippo, right? And yet that's really what it's about. I am especially passionate about this in the Hispanic community. Uh, because especially in Mexico where I've had you know, the most opportunity to spend time learning Spanish, I've just seen how contraception is flooding in. Flooding in. It is tragic. And I really believe that if we could train and send missionaries to our Hispanic brothers and sisters that would teach natural family planning, it could make a difference. It could really help to infiltrate and change what? The culture, because that's what's been changed. So maybe some of you out there or someone listening, watching you know, the DVD, the video, might be inspired to do that. Because uh, it's really such a great area. Um, what else? What else did you find helpful? Yeah, I, I Terry. thought the correlation with the Genesis was beautiful because we always forget how God, you know, we are made in the image and likeness and how He breathed in us and made us from clay. And it's like, oh yeah, you know, we, mm. I think the people do that, and especially the kids, you know, like mm -hmm. my nieces with parts and parts and anything. I thought, just, we could use that. Oh, that's wonderful. So it was just really helpful looking at Boss again, kind of going back to our roots and seeing how beautiful uh, Genesis 127, the suitcase, and also then Genesis 2 about how God breathed his breath of life into us. Uh, you know what is, I, what I really appreciate about last night is basically what we did last night, you can do for any age of about 10 on up. Because it wasn't about sexual intimacy or the conjugal act. It was about what it means to be a human person. And so this is why uh, theology of the body can be woven into every level of catechetics, beginning very young. 
Uh, and so that's why it's our mission here in the diocese to do that. Christy, did you have your hand up before? Oh, no. no. Okay. <laughs> it was easier. Uh, yeah, to what you just said, um, that it goes beyond you taught to young children as well. Because that was, it was nice to hear you say that it goes beyond the union of just husbands and wives. Okay. And that it's more of a communion of people with each other and giving your gift of self to everyone, not just to your spouse and your marriage. Wonderful. I think that was a great, great summary that it was good to hear that it goes beyond just union, so just beyond uh, the act, the beautiful act of conjugal love between a husband and wife, and it goes to the communion or the community. A lot of people ask me, Katrina, why do you use union and communion? And it's exactly for that reason, because each one pulls out a different element. If we only said union, it, the temptation would be to think that the gift of self is restricted to marriage. And, yet, and if we only said communion, we, would, we could think that, okay, it's only just kind of this more generic gift that doesn't, as your question was asking about the exclusivity, and I did think of a place where we could weave that in, um, about the exclusivity between husband and wife. And so, uh, again, just, and also it reflects God. God is a union, but he's also a communion of persons. I do really think, I know that that's the element that has changed my life the most, especially as a single person to realize that I live the spousal me in my body every day, and this is why I could teach this to 12 and 13 year olds in confirmation, so that they could understand, you know, GS24 is the heart of who we are as persons, that man cannot fully find himself except through a sincere gift of himself, and how old can a child be when you start teaching him or her to make a gift of self? What do you think? What did you say? Exactly. The answer is when free will emerges. That's when it starts. You know, I, it's really, it's not too young to begin, you know, oh, this is your opportunity to make a gift of self. Or, yeah, you know, mom's going to make a gift of self to you by da 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 da. Or, gosh, wasn't that beautiful how your father made a gift of self to you by da 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 da. You know, it's just a matter just like how old does a child have to be to teach them to make the sign of the cross? How old are they when you begin? Two? Three? Do they get it right away? And because they don't get it right away, do you give up? Oh, no. <laughs> just, you take their hand and you say, in the name of the Father, right? It's the same thing with all of this language, this vocabulary. Because look, they're learning, they're, they're learning language. Why not learn the language of the church? Of a robust Trinitarian anthropology while they're learning just human language in general. Okay, a couple more comments. Someone over here had a hand up? Someone, no? Okay, over here. Okay, sorry. Oh, I just was going to make a comment about the new evangelization. Okay, please do. And the new, and, and what struck me is all the two vocabulary. Mm -hmm. I have been listening recently to two focus missionaries. Yes. And they are saying essentially that too, that, that we need to, even in the new evangelization, to um, use a different vocabulary. Mm -hmm. And they work with a lot of college students, mm -hmm. as you know, folks, and who are kind of saying, uh, instead of using all these words simple and sin and things like that, which is it is true, they were saying, you're trying to fill needs with legitimate needs with legitimate ways. Legitimate so need in illegitimate ways. But I mean, kind of trigger that, you know, that job Paul was so wise and so um, holy that came with new vocabulary for us to, to really understand what, and to learn, to relearn, you know, That's the cool. new language. With a new language. Thank you for pointing that out. One of my favorite principles of being Catholic is the both and. Is Jesus true God or true man? Both. Is God three or is he one? Both, right? So should we use old language or new language? Both. Because they need to know the traditional language of the church. But as you said, sometimes that doesn't find a welcome in them. And so. Exactly. So, exact, that's exactly it. So again, to initially illegitimate, legitimate needs in an illegitimate way. I have my own way of saying that. If you don't mind, I'll share it with you. Here's my way of saying that. Right impulse, wrong solution. Right impulse, wrong solution. It's th so often, I mean, in our own lives, it's the right impulse, right? I'm made for union and communion. Ah, wrong solution <laughs> of how to express that fundamental quality of who I am. The other way I've seen this is, it's true, a lot of people, because again, we say sin, and that comes with a whole bunch of baggage for most people. So I've found, especially in working with high school and college age, wounded is a much better word. 
you know, th this is the way we're wounded, or that's harmful. Instead of saying that's sinful, you know, asking them, well, why is this harmful? Or explaining, so I, it's true. We find that, you use that language, and then eventually you want to lead them to the formal or official language of the church so that they're able to be fluent, you know, across the board. Uh, yes? So I have a question about that. You were talking about yesterday, we talked about the characteristics. Right, of the five. Of mm -hmm. the and so we're trying to bridge these things together. Yes. But nobody in the, this other category wants to be told sinful, wrong, Correct. whatever. Right. How, how are you going to talk today about how we're going to bridge that and bring them over? Well, I think it's exactly what she's saying, is using this language that is more phenomenological. What do I mean by that? It means it, it relates to their experience, exactly, because this is where all of the modern culture is all about experience. Right? This is where we often clash because they're, they are basing their judgments on their experience. And so I think the answer to the question is just what you said, is that language creates this bridge. But at some point in time, we have to be conscious of once conversion has begun and is now deepening, then to realize, okay, there's a, you know, we can continue to take them deeper. What are we describing? It's simply this, right? That it's not a line. Where, okay, you learn that and you leave it behind. But rather, okay, you've learned this and now let's spiral deeper. Let's see how it's connected. Let's see how the church, because the church's language also communicates something. That kind of the more experiential or psychological language, like legitimate need, Ill illegitimate uh, w way, doesn't quite communicate. I, I guess I, what we find a little frustrating is mm -hmm. that's what we learned in our how to teach natural family planning is that the culture is experiential. Yes. And that, but what we're finding is, and it's probably our deficiency, of course, but that when we give them our experience and they just chalk that up to, okay, well, that's your experience, but it's not my experience. So we all, it's another choice. Exactly. It's exact. No, you, you, you've hit the nail on the head. This is why, that's, that's why the five characteristics of contemporary culture versus the five characteristics of the sacramental worldview are important. So to realize that that language is a bridge to moving them over to this other worldview. So for instance, it might be as simple as in your natural family planning uh, class, taking 15, 20 minutes to talk about worldview. So even just introducing this concept and helping them see what they don't realize. Oh, I'm coming from this <coughs> worldview. And uh, as a matter of fact, I am working with a parish in Chicago, very large parish, who the pastor has made it his goal to transform the culture of the parish into a theology of the body culture. What a task. <laughs> wow. And so this summer, uh, I went there and I spent five days working on a new workshop for him. Because what he discovered, uh, and someone had asked me last night, I think it was you, Teresa, about trying, yes, about how do you do this work? of transforming the culture of the parish. And if I can just give a, a couple comments on that, um, what I have seen is that first of all, you offer you know, kind of like a, a various theology of the body opportunities for people to attend, whether it's a, a, just a general talk or a couples event or coming in and doing something for the high schoolers. So you kind of just throw the seed out there. And by doing that, what will happen? The chispa will light in some people. And so you will see the spark, and they will get it immediately, and they will be enthusiastic, and they'll want more. Notice who's here? My guess is it happened in your life. Somehow, right, that seed was um, spread for you, and it lit a fire. And so you want to know more. So just by the nature of the message and the content, it will light a fire in some people. But the problem is, is that is maybe 10% of the people. He's like, where in 10? Well, I don't know. I'm just picking on a number. OK, 5%. I, I don't know. It, it just depends. And so then from there, if you really want to change the culture, it means you've got to somehow reach the people who are operating off of the more um, postmodern worldview, which is what we looked at, those five characteristics. How do you do that? Well, so what I did for this parish this last summer is I took a step back and tried to put together a workshop that precisely did what we talked about in those five characteristics of the worldview, is how do you reach people who are operating off of that worldview? 
So without even talking about theology of the body, how do you begin building a bridge to faith for them? And so we worked out, it was really a very basic, basic uh, talks. It was a workshop that you could offer for the parish in general to help people begin to realize the transformation that needs to happen. So the challenge of this work is it has to happen on multiple levels in the sense that you start and you kind of see where the sparks fly. And so you, you kind of harness those, that group of people, and you want to continue building them along. But at some point in time, you've got to try to reach just the general person in the pew for whom they're going to be resistant. And do, have you put that together as a? Absolutely not, because I just created it this summer. <laughs> but the good news is, again, when I get back in a year from now, you know, I'll be available to do these kinds of things and to really be working. Uh, I, you know, my role when I come back, I think, will be a little different than when I left. Before I left, I was out speaking everywhere. <laughs> every moment. I gave about 80 talks a year in the diocese. But I see that when I come back, it will be much more in kind of this role of formation, of helping all of you to do your work. Oh, I am absolutely coming. You no, know, I own a condo here. I mean, this is my, this is my home. <laughs> Unless God sovereignly moves me somewhere else, which he can. I mean, he's God. Uh, so, it's, so it's good. And I wanted to offer, you know, in the meantime, if I can help you, my, my time is limited because I'm studying. Um, but, you know, if I can help you begin this process of kind of throwing out the seed. And there are people in the diocese that have um, gone through this and through my Theology of the Body speaker training who are available to speak in your parishes. And I also have a number of DVDs that are available. And so I was thinking this morning, well, how can I encourage you? And I think this is a way. Uh, I had mentioned to um, Teresa last night, also my book, Every Woman's Journey, or it's also republished under the title of Discovering the Feminine Genius. There are lots of parishes who've done that as a book study. You know, they just gather women together. So you just find any little way, any little way. It doesn't have to start off as, you know, like an RCIA program in terms of, OK, it's highly structured. We know where we're going. We got this. Just start. Just start. That's what we did with the John Paul II Resource Center here eight years ago. You know, I just, we just started. So patience. Think in terms of 5, 10, 20 years. Not in terms of nine months. Uh -huh. I took away last night the brilliance of John Paul II taking the 1960s philosophy of experiment, uh, uh, finding ourselves, and the 1970s philosophy of Jesus is, you know, the personalization of Jesus. Yeah. Which the Catholic Church has always had um, personal experience with right. Jesus, and put it together. Mm -hmm. And when you said that he came in in 1978 to his position in Rome as Pope, with this in hand, it totally made sense. I'm like... Because it put it in kind of context for you, historical well, context? This modern nice. Way, Very nice. And where society and culture took it to one extreme, yeah. he's elevating it and took this, these techniques to the other, because we'll hear about the 60s and 70s, the experimental time period, and you know, this, uh, the time of self, putting yourself in the center. Right. And he's saying, okay, let's still use that and still find God, still see God's revelations and divinity. And that's wonderful. Thank you. I, thought that, I think that's a great place to move on to panel two. So who can tell me what was the uh, key word for panel one? Union. Union, my favorite word, right? And theology of the body means? God. Oh, come on, you all. Where, where's the book? <laughs> Thank you, thank you, thank you. OK, theology of the body means? The body reveals God. Fabulous. And how does the body reveal God? By being one nature embodied in two ways for the purpose of the union and communion through a sincere and fruitful gift of self. Wonderful. And Adam and Eve were naked and not ashamed because they had the big DV. What was that? Divine. The divine. And if you have the divine vision, that means you can see what two things? Right, the physical dimension and the spiritual reality, the visible and invisible. So you can see what something is, and you grasp, you apprehend the spiritual reality behind it. Wonderful. OK, I think with that, then we're ready to go forward. So I wanted to begin with a quote from Benedict. Uh, he announced the year of faith in his apostolic letter called Dora Faith. And in number seven, he said this. 
to rediscover the content of the faith. So when you hear content of the faith, what does that mean? Okay, it means doctrine. Right? The content of the faith is expressed in doctrine. And how is the content of the faith communicated? Through catechetics. So he's speaking about the communication of the teachings of the, of the church. And when that's done in a systematic way, that's what we call catechesis or catechetics. So re to rediscover the content of the faith that is professed, celebrated, lived, and prayed, and to reflect on the act of faith is a task that every believer must make his own, especially in the course of this year of faith. So I thought, again, it's a great description of the new evangelization. Listen again to it. To rediscover the content of the faith that is professed, celebrated, lived, and prayed, and to reflect on the act of faith is a task that every believer must make his own. So it's part of what we're doing, isn't it? Is that we're re-looking again at what the content of the faith is. We're reflecting on it. <clears throat> we're trying to live it. I'm sure that you will see how much the LAG of the body lends itself to being prayed with. You know, I often will tell people, take this passage and just sit in front of the Blessed Sacrament with it and let it speak to you. I mean, we have to be praying these texts. Just like we pray the, the texts of Scripture, I think theology of the body is similar. Why? Because it's based on Scripture. And it's meant to take us through this, again, human panorama, which is also the history of salvation. Uh, and so I just wanted to see how, you know, from all kinds of different directions of the church, we're receiving the same word, the same exhortation. So we are transitioning from panel one, which is our life in the beginning, God's original design and intention for the human person, and now over into panel number two, um, our life after sin. And the key word for this panel is lust. In a way, that's correct and not correct. Uh, really, the word in the text is concupiscence. So again, another new word in the sense that it's not a word that we use regularly, but it's a very strong word in our Catholic tradition. So John Paul II uses the word concupiscence repeatedly in this section but mostly to speak of lust. So what's the difference between concupiscence and lust? It's the difference between a general category and a specific expression of it. So for instance, if I say color, you know that that means that's a general category. And if I say blue, you know that that's a specific item, right? It's a specific expression of the general category of color. So it's the same relationship between concupiscence and lust. Concupiscence means disordered desire in general. It means an inclination. So in the call program, when I would speak about this to the teenagers, I would have them stand up and lean over and lean over and try not to fall. But what's the problem? If you lean far enough, you fall. Well, that's concupiscence. Concupiscence is our inclination, our leaning toward disordered desire. That's the result of sin. And then what do you think lust might be as a specific expression of disordered desire? What does it have to do with? Does it have to do with food? No, that's gluttony. What does it have to do with? Sexual, sexual desire. Exactly. So lust means disordered sexual desire. And so what he's going to address is not only concupiscence, so disordered desire in general, but also more specifically disordered sexual desire. We're still in the first half, and what's the heading for the first half? The words of Christ. So that means John Paul II, again, is going to springboard from the words of Christ. And I should just note right here that panel two is divided in half. So this is what I affectionately, this is why I asked you to make it big. This is what I affectionately call 2A. It's a real technical term. OK, so panel 2A is life after original sin with the keyword of concupiscence or lust. And the scriptural springboard for this panel is from the Sermon on the Mount, from Matthew 5, where Jesus says, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, whoever looks at a woman to desire her, and in the text, the translator put in a reductive way. Because is desire in and of itself wrong? No. no. We are made to desire. 
We are made to desire. Actually, we should desire before we choose. But that desire needs to be directed correctly. So if we just said to desire her, we could misunderstand and say, oh, desire is bad. No, no, it's disordered desire. That's wrong. So whoever looks at a woman to desire her in a reductive way has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So here, Jesus connects adultery not just with the physical act of sexual union, which is what the Old Testament emphasis had been, but he also connects this disordered desire. So in other translation, whoever looks at a woman with lust. So he connects that with something else. What else does he connect it with? Not just the physical act, the heart, the interiority. In other words, it matters what's going on inside. It doesn't just matter what our physical action is, although those are important. But what's going on inside also matters. And there's one other thing he connects it with. He connects it with the heart and what else? It begins with an S. Seeing, sight. Look at, did you notice it? Whoever looks at a woman to desire her in a reductive way. So lust has to do with the heart, with the interior, and with sight. Key, key, key. Let's read the next quote from audience 25. Such a desire as an interior act, there he's talking about the heart, it expresses itself through the sense of sight, that is, with a look. The relation of desire with the sense of sight was particularly emphasized in Christ's work. I want to jump away from the text for a moment and share with you a conclusion that I've come to that's helped me understand John Paul II's uh, writings about concupiscence and lust and their re uh, relationship to original sin. OK, so we saw that before in Boss, what did Adam and Eve have? Right, the big DV, which meant that they saw both the physical dimension and the spiritual reality. So they were able to see what's visible and understand what's invisible. But as a result of original sin, the church teaches us that they lost sanctifying grace, which is the presence of the Holy Spirit within. But they also lost something else. What do you think it was? Exactly, they lost the divine vision. Their eyes were indeed open, but I like to say they were open to seeing what? Only, exactly, only the physical dimension. What does that sound like? Modern culture that says only what's visible is real. So their eyes were open to seeing only the physical dimension, only to what's visible. Uh, I like to say that sin is always, always reductionistic. That's the heart of sin. The heart of sin is taking something or someone and reducing it just to its physical dimension. So here in the diocese, our uh, coordinator director of natural family planning is Cindy Leonard. And she came up with a great way to describe what sin does with us. So if you'll take your hand, please, and make a circle out of it, and put it over one eye, close the other eye, OK, now I want you to look at the person next to you, OK? And I want you, without looking down, tell me what color are his or her shoes. <laughs> Why do you laugh? Why can't you tell me? What's the answer? You can't see them. Why? Because your sight is limited. This is a great, great illustration of what sin does to us is that sin takes and reduces our vision, our sense of sight. Remember what we saw faith does? Faith is a light that's capable of illuminating every aspect of human existence. We saw John the 23rd said that we should have this look, this look again at faith that gives us a new vision, a new sense of sight. So if we can learn to connect faith with sight, I think it will be so, so rich that when we are fully Catholic, does it narrow our understanding of reality in the human person? No, see, this is the bridge that has to happen, is that it actually expands our understanding. Why? Because we're no longer walking around like this. We're walking around like this. And being able to see, we could say in a way, with both eyes, to see both the physical dimension and the spiritual reality. So let's see how uh, John Paul II summarizes original sin from audience 26. The man who picks the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, 
makes at the same time a fundamental choice. So it wasn't just a mistake. It wasn't kind of, oh, we didn't know God. Sorry. No, it's a choice and carries it through against the will of the creator, God Yahweh, by accepting the motivation suggested by the tempter. You will not die at all. Rather, God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will become like God, knowing good and evil. So unfortunately, when we read it in English, there's an image that gets lost in the translation. And it has to do with the verb to know in Hebrew. So in Hebrew, the verb to know means to know by, what do you think that blank is? Experience. It means to know by experience. In Genesis, it says, and Adam knew his wife Eve. That's a way of saying he knew her in the most intimate way possible through the one flesh union, through that beautiful act of love between a husband and wife. In other languages, the, there is this distinction between knowing data and facts and knowing by experience. So for instance, in Spanish, what are the two verbs? Saber and conocer, right? So saber means, OK, you know, you know data, you know facts, or you know how to do an ability. So for instance, if we use that sense of knowing about something, how many of you know about skydiving? That if I asked you what it was, you could tell me. Great, right? That's saber. Conocer is different. It means to know by experience. I had a really interesting experience of this when I was in Guatemala one time working on my Spanish. One of the women I met there said, would you like to come know my house? She used the, verse, the, the verb conocer. Quieres conocer mi casa? I thought, that's really strange. And then I realized, no, it makes perfect sense. What was she saying? Would you like to come to my house and experience it? The way we use it in English, we would kind of colloquially, it's like, are you familiar with? Or do you know by experience? So how many of you know, conocer, skydiving by experience? Yeah, see? OK, so could you tell me a little bit more about it than the rest of us who only know about it? Saber? Absolutely. So this is the, this is the sense of the verb to know in Hebrew that you know by experience. OK, so with that background, let's go back to the text then. So, at, so Satan says, you will not die at all. Rather, God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will become like God, knowing good and evil. So I read that with John Paul II's teachings in the background of my mind, and, and, and I think, oh, that implies that before original sin, Adam and Eve only knew what by experience? Good. They only knew good by experience. Why? Because their will was directly ordered to the good. That's what a good will is. We saw last night. That's what virtue is, this habitual choosing of the good with ease, in fact. So the only thing they really got was the evil. Correct exactly right. So here's my visual aid to describe that, this. Who could tell me what is this? Raisin. It's a raisin. Is the raisin in its original state? No. Is it in boss? No. Its original state would be a nice, plump grape that then we could squeeze to make a nice, robust wine. OK, but that's another story. <laughs> that was last night. OK, it's a raisin. What's happened to the raisin? It's been dehydrated. It's been reduced down mm -hmm. to an inadequate state. This is what sin does to us. You'll never eat a raisin again the same, right? <laughs> and I hope you'll never drink a glass of red wine the same. Do you see how we try to use everyday things? I want to really encourage you in, our, in our, your catechesis, in your parenting, even just in your home. Right, to have things around. This is why we put crucifix and other things. But you know, there are other ways we can kind of have things around or, so that when we experience them, what should they be? An occasion for faith, for reminding us. So this is what sin has done for us, is it's reduced us down to really this inadequate state. Why? Because now we only see, with, I, we could call it monovision, 
So we only see the physical dimension, and the world around us has been reduced down just to its material reality. And we've forgotten, uh, just to the physical dimension, we've forgotten the spiritual reality. So after sin surfaced, Adam and Eve experienced just what you said, Darren, the evil of reducing something down to its physical dimension and using it apart from God's design. You know what? Satan didn't lie. This is what's interesting. He didn't lie. Because now they and all humanity know good and evil. How? By experience. By experience. Oh, yes. Robert. He, he lied when he said that it opened their eyes. Exactly, because it opened their eyes to what? Evil. To evil. So in a way, he didn't lie, but it was, again, a trick. Isn't this the way Satan works? Look, if you do this, this will happen. There's a kernel of truth in it, isn't it? And that's why we take it. If it was blatant, we wouldn't. What was that, Patty? The ultimate politician. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, in an unfortunate modern sense of that word, <laughs> it's just so true. And he said that they would be like God's knowing, like God's. What does it mean to be like God or God? It means that you decide what's good and evil. Why? Because you have created everything and you know what its telos is. So think about how we have now in our modern age made ourselves into gods. Because what is matter? Simply neutral stuff. What does that mean? Who's now responsible for deciding what's good and evil? Me, because I impose value on reality. Isn't it fascinating? It comes right back around. I mean, the Bible in its first chapters, brilliant. Brilliant. The universal and eternal truths that it teaches. But sometimes it takes a genius like John Paul II to help us look at it from a different perspective and connect it with our experience. OK, so let's go on. Audience 26. By casting doubt in his heart on the deepest meaning of the gift, meaning the gift of creation, the gift of life, that is on love as the specific motive of creation and of the original covenant. Why did God create you? Out of love. And if he created you out of love, does that mean he's going to withhold what's good for you? No, but that's the lie we believe. Look, if God really loved you, dot, 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 dot. How many times do we fall for that? God is a father who desires only our good, our perfection. But sometimes that's different than what we desire. So the deepest meaning of the gift, that is, on love is the specific motive of creation and of the original covenant. Uh, this, to me, is so poetic. Man turns his back on God love. Isn't that a beautiful way of describing God? On God love, on the Father. He, in some sense, casts him from his heart. At the same time, therefore, he detaches his heart and cuts it off, as it were, from that which comes from the Father. In this way, what is left in him is what comes from the world. Can you see the physical dimension and spiritual reality in there? Okay, what phrase does John Paul II use to describe the physical dimension? Exactly, what comes from the world. And what does he use to describe the spiritual reality? What comes from the Father. So after sin, what is left in us, according to the text? What comes only from the world? Instead of what comes from the Father and what comes from the world. Is what comes from the world bad? Only if it's disordered. But in boss. It was all good. You see, we are this beautiful combination of what comes from the Father and what comes from the world. It should find its uh, wedding in us because we are both body and spirit. We are this unique combination where the spiritual and the material intersect. So as a result of original sin, we look at people with monovision, with this way, with our reduced vision. And so we see each other. Unfortunately, we reduce each other down to the physical dimension 
So we can use others for our own pleasure and benefit apart from God's design. This is what happens as a result of original sin. And because of that, then a new state in human nature emerges, and it's the beginning of lust. What does it say about Adam and Eve? Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they realized that they were naked. And what did they do? Everything. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. They covered their nakedness. What did nakedness symbolize in the beginning? The divine vision, transparency, lack of shame. What is shame? Shame is when something that is intensely personal and interior suddenly becomes broadcasted or exposed on the outside. So something that we understand should remain only in a, in a kind of a private, exclusive, specific sphere. Well, Adam and Eve, because they had the divine vision, was there anything they needed to hide from each other? Nada. Nothing, because they knew that the other always saw them with the eyes of God. In our culture, can we walk around naked and not ashamed? We can't. Why? What are we afraid of? Being used. Yeah, exactly. We're afraid. If I showed up this morning <laughs> in my birthday suit, why would that be a problem? Would you have a hard time encountering me? Yeah, what? Because my body would be distracting. Can you imagine what it would be like to no longer have the body be distracting from encountering the person, but the very way in which we encounter the person? That's what it means to be naked and not ashamed. Yes. And in what way? Because um, I had it clear when you were talking, but not now. Um, I know, th these things zip into your mind, right? And then it's like, oh, it's gone. But try. Because, the way, you know, you would be here with no clothes on. OK, it's not going to happen. I just want, <laughs> want to be clear. But you know, people are distracted by that uh -huh. in the same way that you are distracted from truly meeting somebody else. Mm -hmm. After original sin. After original sin. After original sin. Uh -huh. um, in that they are, they're looking at you with the distraction, and and that almost transfers itself to me. It, it does, but it, but it also calls for a, a certain responsibility on your part to dress modestly, to, so that you're not putting out exactly, so that I'm communicating the right message, so that I'm I'm com communicating authentically who I am. Yeah, it's true. And so can you see how, uh, can you see how, what the task is? I mean, really, after, after original sin um, has surfaced, you know, the task is tremendous, isn't it? I think it's one of the reasons why some people get tattooed, is to kind of like, kind of find that in themselves, that expression. That expression. Like, look at me, but don't look at me. It, it, it's, it's, you know, <laughs> From really, because, right, because it almost so puts, person, mm -hmm. in a way it's like, I need you to tell you something so important about myself. It's really, and I, because we, we want to self-express. Yes. We want to self-express, and so we find other ways of doing this. Uh huh. But, you know, it's interesting what she said, that, that the, you know, putting yourself out there like that, you become preoccupied with the reaction. That's, that's excellent. When you put yourself out there like that, when you un, inappropriately expose yourself, then you do. You, you become preoccupied with what's the reaction going to be um, to my self-disclosure. <laughs> OK, I'm sorry. We have to move on, because there are all kinds of ways we can go with this. Um, but I don't want to keep you here till midnight tonight. All right. So uh, let's look at why Adam and Eve clothed themselves. Adam and Eve clothed themselves not because they saw each other's naked bodies for the first time. This is so important, because again, I've heard this taught, right? That their eyes were open and they realized that they were naked. They didn't realize they were naked before? Of course they did. And this is John Paul II's whole point. It's not that they were naive. It's not that they were, had a 
were deprived, that they experienced deprivation. It was a fullness. Now they're actually deprived. And so they realize they clothed themselves, not because they saw each other's naked bodies for the first time. They knew that they were naked. Um, but because, and you might want to follow along in your workbook, Adam looks at Eve and sees her only in her physical dimension and realizes he can use her body as an object apart from the divine design. And it goes the other way, too. Eve now looks at Adam with monovision, losing the divine vision, and realizes for the first time that she can see him only in his physical dimension and therefore use him for her own pleasure and benefit apart from God's design. So this is the punchline. They cover themselves not because the body is bad. That is a heresy. Get rid of it. Do not let it creep in anywhere. Body bad, spirit good. That is a heresy, and it is alive, alive and well. Um, I noticed that at least one person bought the book Freedom last night. Um, which are 12 testimonies of how theology of the body changed people's lives. And my testimony is one of them. And my testimony for theology of the body is precisely this. As I like to say, I was a closet Platonist, which meant I experienced the fact that my soul was trapped in a body. And that to be really holy, all I needed to do was ignore or kind of get rid of the body and live out of my spiritual dimension, and I would be really holy. Wrong heresy, and it was theology of the body that took me out of that. But I didn't realize that I was a closet Platonist. I think most people, this is their misimpression of what holiness is, is that the body is kind of irrelevant, best that I really don't give it any attention, and that I just really only work on being spiritual. I mean, think of our language. Jesus came to save souls. Really? That's incorrect. Who did Jesus come to save? Persons. And we saw in Voss, what does it mean to be a person? What did Benedict say? You are a unified creature of body and soul. He did not come to save souls. So the body is not bad. They cover themselves because they lost the divine vision. They're afraid. They're afraid that the other will use them. Why? Because what does shame tell us? That there's a deep core within me that needs to be respected and protected. And now, with this loss of the divine vision, there's the fear that this deep core within me will be exposed and therefore will be abused or used or not treated with honor. So in a way, I think what we can say is they feel naked. Have any of you had that experience of feeling naked? I was trying to think of my own experience. Where do I feel, experience this fear? Well, I love to hike. And what that means is sometimes I have to go to the bathroom in those annoying porta potties, you know, or when you go to big events. And sometimes they don't always latch real well. And I realize, like, that's where I experience sometimes this sense of fear of being exposed. Because there you are in a porta potty, and the door is like four feet away. And you're powerless. If someone were to open that door, would you go, hi? <laughs> no, if they were to open that door, what would you do? Yeah, right? That's the experience of feeling naked, of feeling exposed. That's what Adam and Eve experienced as a result of sin. So that when they looked at their naked body, it, never, it no longer told them that they were made for union and communion through a sincere gift of self. Instead, I like to say they were literally stripped of the spousal meaning of the body. So that now when we look at each other, that's not in our nakedness. That's not what first comes to mind. So let's look at a key audience from audience 27. So John Paul II is commenting on Genesis 3.10. The words I was afraid because I am naked and I hid myself attest to a radical change in this relationship. What relationship? Multiple relationship. Relationship between Adam and Eve, relationship between Adam and God, relationship of Adam and Eve with their body. Man, in some sense, loses the original certainty of the image of God expressed in his body. You want a line to take to prayer? It's a f profound line. To meditate, what does it mean that we lost 
the original certainty of the image of God expressed how? Through the body. That the body was a symbol, an icon, an expression of God. He also loses, in a certain way, the sense of his right to participate in the perception of the world, which he enjoyed in the mystery of creation. The right had its foundation in man's innermost being, in the fact that he himself participated in the divine vision. So there's that phrase in the text. In the divine vision of the world and of his own humanity, which gave him a deep peace and joy in living the truth and value of his body. What a profound, again, description of what life was like before original sin and therefore what life is like after original sin. A lot of times I think we don't understand the tragedy of original sin because we don't understand what we, happened in, what we had in Boss. If you take nothing else away from this workshop, although I hope you take lots and lots away, away, I hope you will see, as someone said in our opening comments, how important this panel is. You can't know what you lose if you don't know what you had to begin with. So I think we need to spend a whole lot more time on this dimension before we jump to here, so we can understand the tragedy that sin is and all that we lost. So I want to look at another PT. We're up to PT number nine, I think, that I sidestepped last night because I figured, OK, you'd had enough new vocabulary, although we hinted at it last night. And it's the sacramentality of the body. So we already saw, using our simple definition, if the body is sacramental, then that means it's a, what's the V word? Visible, Visible sign of an? invisible reality. So this is key, this term, the sacramentality of the body. The body is a visible sign of an invisible reality. In other words, what you can see, what can you see of me? My body. So what you can see of me expresses what you cannot see of me. What's invisible about me that you can't see? My soul, right? That's the immaterial dimension of me. You can't see my Katrina-ness directly, can you? <laughs> you can only see my Katrina-ness through my body and how I express myself through my body. That's why to know Katrina is to know that I love to dance. It's to know that I love tango. It's to know that I love the sun. It's to know that I love so many things. But you only can see that through my body. So in the first place, my body is a visible sign of the invisible me my soul, my Katrina-ness that you cannot see. But the deepest truth of my Katrina-ness, of my personhood, is that I as a person reflect who? God. So that means the body is doubly sacramental. This would be a great exam question. Write an essay, short, on how the body is doubly sacramental. Who can finish, who can complete that next line? So the body is doubly sacramental because it's a visible sign of the invisible me and the invisible T. Begins with a T. Trinity. Remember, this is a robust Trinitarian anthropology. So the body is doubly sacramental because it's a visible sign of the invisible me, my soul, my Katrina-ness and the invisible trinity. Can you see God directly? Where's my, uh, oh, what do I do with it? Oh, well, my mountain's covered up. Oh, here it is, way back here, right? So it's a visible sign of the invisible me and the invisible trinity that you cannot see, but you can see through my body. So let's look at one of the most significant quotes in all of Theology of the Body. So we saw one of them last night, where John Paul II describes spousal me of the body. Remember where he said, that is? And I said, you should be jumping up and down for joy. Where he talked about how uh, this, the spousal me of the body is that the body is made to express love through self-gift. Here's his description of the sacramentality of the body from audience 19. The body, in fact, and only the body, is capable of making visible what is invisible, the spiritual and the divine. It has been created to transfer into the visible reality of the world, the mystery hidden from eternity to God, hidden from eternity in God, and thus to be a sign of it. Can you hear the sacramental language? Who can describe, who can tell me what's the, sac the sacramental language? What's, what's the vocabulary used in that quote? When you hear it, it's like, oh, this is sacramental. What is it? Uh, visible and invisible. Visible and invisible. Anytime visible and invisible 
occurs together, ding! Right? It should be the little fairy, the little sacramental fairy should show up. Ding! We're talking about sacramentality. It's been created to transfer into the visible reality of the world, visible reality of the world, the mystery. Can we see the mystery of God directly? No. So the mystery hidden from eternity of, in God and thus to be a sign of it. I have other, another workshop that connects theology of the body with the catechism of the Catholic Church. Fabulous, fabulous. We don't have time to make all those references, but I want to make one here. And it's Catechism 234. It's easy to remember, 234. Here's what it says. The mystery of the Most Holy Trinity is the central mystery of Christian faith and life. What's the central mystery? The Most Holy Trinity. What are we doing creating a robust Trinitarian anthropology? What has got to be at the heart of the new evan evangelization? The Trinity. Understanding God as Trinity. It is the mystery of God in himself. The light. Right? Faith is a light. The light that enlightens all the other mysteries of the faith. Do we want to lead, lead people to encounter the living Christ? Of course. Is that the end of the story? No. We want to have them encounter the living Christ so that they can encounter the Father in the love and communion of the whole love and communion of the Holy Spirit. So the, the Trinity is the central mystery of our faith that sheds light on everything else. And it's through our bodies that people can encounter, wow, the central mystery of the faith. Wow, huh? Yeah, wow. So then when they counter, encounter you, what should they encounter? The Trinitarian mystery. What does that mean? The Father pouring himself out in gift to the Son. The Son pouring himself out in gift to the Father. And the Holy Spirit bursting forth as a fruit of their self-giving love. What should they encounter in you? Gift. What kind of gift? Total self-giving love. Why? Because that's who the Trinity is. All right, but that's back to the good news. We have to keep continue with the bad news. But see, this is what's interesting. In this panel, John Paul II doesn't only just remain talking about sin. He continues to spiral back. Like, you actually learn a lot about Boss from panel 2A. Because he goes back and he continues to, to, to wow, continues to contrast what we lost with what we had. So the bad news is that with original sin, this unity, the unity between the visible and the, in, and the invisible, the physical dimension and the spiritual reality, is broken. We lose our sacramental sight. We're now reduced to mono vision. And that means the body has difficulty expressing me. And it has difficulty expressing God. I have trouble expressing my body according to its telos. What's my body's telos? The body reveals God. Exactly, to reveal God. How? Through union and communion, through a sincere gift of self. In this historical existence, that's my body's telos. So let's go back to John Paul II in the text from audience 28. The words, I am afraid because I'm naked, reveal a certain constitutive fracture so constitutive means at the very foundational level. In the human person's interior, remember John Paul II says, whoever looks at a woman to desire her in a reductive way has already committed adultery where? In his heart, in his interior. Sin affects us interiorly. So the, in the human person's interior, a breakup, as it were, of man's original spiritual and somatic unity. All right, we don't usually use the term spiritual and somatic unity. Who can translate those in for me into more common everyday terms? Body and spirit, right? So he's saying there is this break, this fracture between body and spirit. So body and spirit, as we've been seeing, not only John Paul II, but Benedict tells us body and spirit are meant to go together, like peanut butter and jelly, chips and salsa, right? You don't normally eat... Uh, peanut butter and ketchup. Ugh. They don't go together. Peanut butter and jelly, yeah, they go together. Chips and salsa, great combination. The other image I like to use is that of a musical piece. Anyone here play the piano? Any piano players? Okay, 
Wonderful. So if you have a, a piece of music, there's the harmony line and the melody line. And Patty, if you were to play those on the piano and the way the composer designed them, and you were to play them, how would it sound? Exactly, it would sound beautiful because one brings out the beauty of the other. Okay, now because you're a liberated 21st century woman, you're going to exercise your free choice and you're going to shift the harmony, harmony line, just three notes, that's all. And now you're gonna play it, how's it gonna sound? Ouch, cover your ears, right? It sounds horrible, why? Because you're not playing it in the way the composer designed it. I think this is a great image of our life after sin. The emboss, this is the way body and spirit worked. Notice it's unity indifference. Remember I said we come back to that. Unity in distinction. They're not collapsed on top of each other. What makes them beautiful is precisely the fact that they are distinct and different. But when they are in harmony, according to the way they are designed, it's beautiful, each bringing out the beauty of the other. But when we shift it, it's now discordant. So this is life after sin. The body is following one rhythm and tempo, and the spirit is following another, and the result is, ouch, discord, disintegration, disharmony in our very being. This is what St. Paul describes so well in Romans 7. Remember Romans 7? I do not what I want to do. Precisely, I see a law at work in my body which is different than what I want to choose and play out. We have this disharmony, this disintegration. So here's a happy state after sin surfaced. We have directly disobeyed God, and that creates a separation between us and God because John Paul II says we've cast God out of our hearts, and we lose the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and it's created a rupture, not only between us and God, but where, where else? Within ourselves, right? Between body and spirit, but also between Adam and Eve. So before we go forward, you'll notice, like John Paul II, I want to spiral around. I want to take a couple steps back again, back to our state and boss, to see that before original sin surfaced, Adam and Eve lived the spousal me in the body perfectly with what I like to call, go New York! Oh, sorry if we don't have any New York fans here, but it just has to work this way for sake of example. Okay, go New York. We lived in Boss in union and communion with go New York. Who, what does the G stand for? God. What about the O? Others. Others. What do you think N stands for? What do we call the world around us? Nature. Nature. And why? Yourself. Within yourself, between what are the two components? Body and spirit. Body and spirit. God created us to live in union and communion, in harmony. The catechism calls it the four harmonies. With going to New York, God, others, nature, and within yourself, between body and spirit. All right, uh, let's see, Rose, since you're right here, would you do me a favor? Could you stand up and come around on the other side for a moment? Okay, what I'd like to ask you to do, so we're gonna do a little kinesthetic thing here for Rose. And for all the rest, all the rest of you. Okay, so you're gonna have to crack it hard here. I want you to crack the egg, and I want you. To, have you ever separated like going back and forth from? I've in the tempted. Show? You've tempted. Okay, <laughs> wonderful. So I want you to try that. Here, you got a napkin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right here. Ooh, look at that. Ooh, okay, go, go, go. Perfect. Okay, great. So what has she just done? Separated, separated what? The yoke from the, okay, great. Now, Rose, what I'd like you to do is put it back together, the way it was. <laughs> I like that, I'm sorry, that doesn't work for me. Is that the way it was in its original state? No. Why do I ask her to do this? What are we representing? Exactly, thank you. This is sin. You want a fun exercise for your high schoolers? Okay. This is what sin does for, to us. It ruptures, it separates us. So if you don't want to do an egg, just buy one of these. All right, what is this? An egg separator. What's its purpose? Separate eggs, right? So you, you know, you crack the egg, you put it here. I could have had you put it here, but it's not as fun, right? And the yolk stays here and the white filters through. This is a profound image of what sin does to us. Sin's purpose, it also has a telos. What's the purpose of sin? To separate us from? 
Go New York. What is it? God, others, nature, and within yourself, between body and spirit. And can we put it back together on our own? No. No. This is the tragedy of our state after sin. Rose, thank you so much. You're such a trooper. <laughs> So scripture describes all four of these ruptures. This is just, it's profound, but sometimes we have to just kind of stop and in a sense let the text emerge. Out of the text emerge the truth that it's trying to tell us. So how does Adam and Eve, how does scripture shows, show the rupture between God and Adam and Eve? When God shows up after they've eaten the fruit, what do Adam and Eve do? They hide. Again, this is not an innocent game of hide and seek. Like, okay, God, come find us. No, it's a profound image of hiding. They're clothing, they're cloaking themselves from God. How does scripture describe the rupture between man and woman? When God says to Adam, have you eaten of the fruit of the tree? Does he say, oh, mea culpa, mea culpa, I'm sorry, I did it. <laughs> That's right. The woman, the one that you gave to me. I like to call this, this is the original blame shift. Right? He doesn't take the responsibility. He shifts the blame. And what does Eve do? She shifts the blame to the serpent. Again, this is a profound description of the rupture now between Adam and Eve. In audience 30, John Paul II says, after breaking the original covenant with man, so he's ruptured his relationship with God, man and women did not find themselves united with each other, but rather more divided. And this next part almost makes me weep. Or even set against each other because of their masculinity and femininity. What did we see last night? What is the symbolic meaning of being male and female? What's my favorite word? Union. And look at what John Paul II is saying. Now, it's precisely their masculinity and femininity that's going to be an occasion for what? Dif se separation. So what are we trying to do? We're trying to say, men and women, there's no difference. We're trying to overcome the rupture caused by original sin, in which God's original design, which is still in effect, is unity in distinction. We're trying to overcome that rupture, how? By having unity in sameness. Not many things change. Sameness has become the measure of equality. If we make everyone and everything the same, then we'll be equal. God's design is equality in distinction, not fundamentally in sameness. How does scripture describe the nupture between us and creation? In other words, our, nupture, our rupture with nature. As the, part of the consequences, God tells Adam that he's going to uh, toil in his work, and woman will bring forth children in labor, in pain. This is a profound description of our relationship with the created order. For men, work was supposed to be a joy. Why? Because it's a cooperation in the liturgical act. What happens when you work? You catch up creation and you bring it back to God. Remember the Byzantine image of Trinity? The Father, uh, the father generates the Son, gives all that he is to the Son to generate the Son, and then through generating the Son, he generates the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit catches everything up and leads it back to the Father. That is a profound expression of work. We're called to catch all creation up and lead it back to God. It's liturgy. So what I find interesting is, and women will bring forth children in pain. These are all expressions of fruitfulness. As human persons, it's our nature to be fruitful. Why? Because God is fruitful. He's not a sterile duality. He's a fruitful trinity. So it's our very nature to be fruitful. And so we, again, sin goes to the heart of what it means to be a human person, created for fruitfulness. Yes? When you were talking about the rupture, and you said before it was, it was supposed to be, was it equality with distinction? 
question. Yes. So equality, absolutely. I'm glad you asked. Equality and difference. Indifference. So in other words, Adam and Eve are different, right? <laughs> it's obvious by looking at them. And in their difference, it's, but they share an equality. Why? Because they come from the same body and they share the same nature. And so what's happening, again, in our culture is we are rearranging our culture to say that equality only comes from sameness when we treat everyone as if they're the same. This is very subtle. So it wipes out the harmony. It, exactly. Exactly. It collapses. It collapses. That's it. I mean, there are all kinds of images. And this is, this is a hard one kind of at first to wrap your brain around. I'm going to make it, I'm going to push it in even a little bit even more. We have a very wonderful word in our doctrine, in our dogma, that we don't use very often. But it's become one of my favorite words, and maybe I'll make another talk just on this. It's the hypostatic union. Now be honest, how many of you have ever heard of that term? Who's never heard of that term? Wonderful, thank you for being honest. This is key. The hypostatic union refers to what person? To Jesus. The hypostatic union, we profess it every Sunday at the Creed. The hypostatic union means that Jesus is true what? God. And here's the question. Is Jesus one person or two persons? What kind of person is Jesus? What is the nature of his person, divine. So what we have here, is we have unity in distinction. Want to know what the ground is for male and female? It's here expressed in the hypostatic union expressed in the union of divinity and humanity. Perfectly united, and yet do we believe that in Jesus' person, his divinity swallowed up his humanity, so he only kind of had the appearance? No. What do we believe? Perfect union, perfect distinction. Now, I wouldn't suggest that you start off, you know, your eighth grade catechism with this. <laughs> Why am I saying this? I'm saying this to help you see how so much in theology of the body is like a doorway. It's a doorway, it's a faith, porta fide. That if we walk through, oh my goodness, look at what it illuminates. Now, John Paul II doesn't talk about hypostatic union, but this principle of unity and distinction is all over theology of the body. Yes? That's exactly. This is, this is why I say right, it took 600 years. Exactly. This is why I said last night it took 600 years to figure out what this meant. And the last thing to be decided was did Jesus have one will or two wills? This is what it took them 600 years to get around to trying to figure out. Who can tell me what's the answer? Did Jesus have one will or two wills? Who says he had one will? Who said he, has two, he had two will? Who's afraid to vote? <laughs> the answer is two. I was really surprised. Why? Because if he didn't have two wills, he wouldn't have had a true human nature. I think most of us, and it, this was my impression, is that Jesus just had one will. Isn't that uh, the act in the garden? When exactly. It's exactly right. This is what we see in the agony of the, of the garden. This is why it's so important. Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass for me, but not my will, but your will be done. This, how to figure out the relationship between the divine will and the human will of Jesus, you know what? We're still trying to figure it out. We can say some things about it, but it's very difficult. But again, we believe true, uni true unity and true distinction. Jesus had to have a human will in order to be fully human. Because what has original sin affected? The will. So if he didn't have a human will, it could not have been redeemed. Yes? Could you say again what you said about femininity and masculinity? And masculinity. Absolutely. Absolutely, right. 
So where, where do we find the ground for, where do we find the validity to say that in masculinity and femininity, what we have is unity in distinction? We have it right here. In John Paul II's first encyclical, The Redeemer of Man, the opening line is, Jesus Christ, the Redeemer of Man, the Redeemer of Man, Jesus Christ, is the center of the universe and of history. In other words, it's from the incarnation that we take the understanding of history. And we saw from GS 22, Christ fully reveals man to himself and makes the supreme calling clear. So you put those two together, and what you understand is if we look at the incarnation. So another, an easier word for hypostatic union is incarnation. If we look at the incarnation, that becomes the principle. We could say it's the lens through which we understand history and the human person. So again, remember what I said is studying catechetics should be self-illuminating? So that when you study the incarnation and you explain that this is what the incarnation means, then it should explain why we believe that the two become one flesh. But what happens? Are they one or are they two? Exactly. It's the both and. Perfect unity and perfect distinction. Can you see what happens when we say that marriage no longer has to be between a man and a woman? What do we lose? We lose the hypostatic principle. Perfect unity and perfect distinction. So that was the reference I was trying to make of why, again, you know, these things are profound. And they have to kind of get inside of us and percolate. Uh-huh. Say that again. The Redeemer of Man says Jesus is the center of the universe yes. and the center of history. The Redeemer of Man, Jesus Christ, is the center of the universe and of history. That's a Redeemer of Man number one, the opening sentence, another key, key phrase for John Paul II. You'll see it pops up repeatedly in his writings. All right, let's move on. That was just a little extra there. The hypostatic principle extra. So let's look at audience 29 that describes this rupture between us and the material world. The acceptance of the material word, world, meaning nature, in relation to man seems to falter as well. The words of God Yahweh foretell the hostility, as it were, of the world, the resistance of nature against man and his tasks. And we already saw the rupture between body and spirit, that it's expressed, first of all, by clothing themselves that indicates there's now this rupture between body and spirit because they no longer experience the body as revealing the person, but that it can now be used as an object. So John Paul II is going to spiral around now by focusing specifically on lust. Oh, joy of joys, right? What you came to hear this morning. Uh, and concupiscence. So in Genesis 3.16, as part of the consequences of original sin, God tells the woman, your desire will be for your husband, and he will dominate you, or he will lord it over you, or he will rule you. Please, please, please remember that's not God's original design. Unfortunately, many people use that say, look, it says right in the Bible, the man's supposed to dominate the woman. And you say, well, yes, but what's the context? After sin surfaced. It's a result of original sin. John Paul II will say that after sin, we still desire personal union. Josephina, what's our legitimate need as a human person? Personal union. Right, we want to be in union with what? Go New York. So we have a legitimate need, in my language, right impulse, wrong solution. We we'll still desire personal union, but for our own benefit. Legitimate need, illegitimate way. Okay, let's see how concupiscence changes the meaning of the body as expressed in audience 32. In this its own, dis own distinctive character, the body is the expression of the spirit. What kind of language is that? Sacramental. The body expresses, reveals the spirit, my soul, my Katrina-ness. And is called in the very mystery of creation, that means boss, to exist in the communion of persons in the image of God. Can you see him spiraling around? Can you see how he's, you know, catching up everything he's talked about so far? Now, the concupiscence limits and deforms this objective mode of existing of the body, right? Think raisin. 
This is limited. This is deformed. This is not in its original state. Precisely in the experience of the heart, do you see that interiority, phenomenology, the human experience, femininity and masculinity in their mutual relations seem to be no longer the expression of the spirit that tends towards personal communion and are left only as an object of attraction. Tragic, huh? We're left just with a physical dimension that now incites what John Paul II will call the sexual urge, the desire to take and possess. possess. All right, let's read over the next four quotes. And as I do, what I'd like you to do is circle the words that describe how the relationship between men and women are ch is changed as the result of concupiscence and lust. So our relationship with God is profoundly affected. We're now separated from God. But we're also seeing that our relationship between man and woman is profoundly affected. So as I read this, circle those words that describe this change. Uh, from audience 31, from the moment in which the man dominates her, the communion of persons is replaced by a different mutual relationship, namely by a communion of possession of the other in the manner of object of one's own desire. From audience 32, concupiscence in general and the concupiscence of the body in particular. So there he's referring to lust as concupiscence of the body. Attacks precisely this sincere gift. When you hear sincere gift, what should come to mind? GS 24, man cannot fully find himself except through a sincere gift of himself. Attacks precisely this sincere gift. It deprives man, one could say, of the dignity of the gift, which is expressed by his body through femininity and masculinity, and in some sense depersonalizes man, making him an object for the other. From audience 32 again, the relationship of the gift changes into a relationship of appropriation. And finally, again from audience 32, the heart, meaning the interiority of man, has become a battlefield between love and concupiscence. How do you feel after reading those four quotes? It's really depressing, isn't it? I mean, it's stark what sin has done. I mean, sin, you know, because we've psychologized so much of doctrinal language, meaning we have shot it through with human experience and forgotten the objective reality. When we say about something it's a sin, people interpret that to mean that we're saying they're bad. What are we saying? First of all, we're saying they're wounded. There is no such thing as a bad person in the sense of the core of the person being bad. There's a wounded person who chooses bad, who makes bad choices. And we see the effects of sin, of the, of the bad, as opposite of the good, and how it affects our relationship. OK, so tell me, what are some of the words that you circled? Um, Michelle, what word did, give me a word that you circled. Dominates. Dominates. Susan, give me a word. Um, replaces. Replaces, good. Uh, I'm sorry, you don't have your name tag on? Would you? No, um, uh, possession. Possession, good. We'll just go right across the back here. Give me a word. Uh, object of one's own desire. Object of one's own desire. Next, give me a word. Communion of persons. Communion of persons, but that's not what gives me, give me a word. That wasn't, that doesn't specifically say how it changed. Give me a word of how it actually changed. Yeah. Yes, exactly. That's the word. Okay, any more? Deprives, Michael? Concupiscence. Concupiscence, good. Do I'm object for the other. Object for the other. Do we have any left, Tom? Are there any that we haven't said yet? Attacks, Attacks. good. Anything? Appropriates, appropriation. Changes, the, the relationship of the gift changes into a relationship of, of appropriation. That's kind of it in a nutshell. Bless you. That instead of looking at this person as gift with honor and reverence, I see them just as an object of desire that I can take and use. 
So I think all of this makes sense if we understand concupiscence as, and lust as being open to only that which comes from the world, to only the physical dimension. Here's the way I would say it. The man of lust is incapable of encountering the other as person. Because person means you're made in the image and likeness of God for union and communion through a sincere and fruitful gift of self. So the man of lust, the woman of lust, the woman operating out of sin is incapable of encountering the other as a person, but instead encounters the other only as a body object. That's the way I would describe it, would describe it as a body object to be used for my own gratification. We're incapable of seeing the full value of the person. In Love and Responsibility, uh, which is John Paul II's philosophical reflections on human love, so we can say that theology of the body are his theological reflections on human love, but this preceded it. And so Love and Responsibility, this is a brand new translation, um, love and responsibility are his philosophical reflections on human love. I like to think of them kind of as Old Testament and New Testament. Can you understand the New Testament without the Old Testament? No. You really can't. Can you understand the Old Testament without the New Testament? No. Not fully. So it's the same kind of relationship between love and responsibilities like the Old Testament and theology of the bodies like the New Testament. To really understand both of them, it's mutually illuminating. So in Love and Responsibility, John Paul II talks quite a bit uh, about the other, I have to find it in my notes here, um, about the other being a potential object of enjoyment. That that's what lust, it reduces the value of the other to a potential object of enjoyment. Here's the way I was trying to think of it. And, oh, let me see if I have one here. Uh, I was trying to think of an example. Okay, so I have to tell you, when I first started speaking, I didn't use any visual aids. None. But you know, over the course of time, you learn how to be a little more creative. All right, so I have a candy bar here. According to our cultural mindset, What's the difference between me and this candy bar? Nothing. That's correct. Nothing. Because according to our cultural mindset, we are both just matter, objects, raw material, what? Just to be used. So in our cultural mindset, there is no difference. I, OK, it's an exaggeration. Obviously, I'm not as skinny as the candy bar. <laughs> But if you push it to its logical conclusion, there really is no difference. This is what John Paul II is saying, that with concupiscence and lust, the person becomes a potential object of enjoyment. Is this a potential object of enjoyment for you? Yeah. Is this a potential object of enjoyment for you? Yeah. So this is our cultural mindset. This is what he's talking about when he talks about approaching the other. He calls it a value blindness. We can't see the true value of the other. Why? Because we reduce others down to the physical dimension. Let's take a, some concrete examples in our culture. So let's think about abortion for a moment. And this is where we're going to see the importance of language. This why it's so helpful to be learning this new language. So, sorry, Robert. To jump, but uh -huh. Isn't that how it equates the other way around too? Like whales and all that become like people, you know, like yeah. trees. There's, yeah. OK, so think, what's the, what's the principle that our culture is operating off of? Unit, unity, um, digni unity in Same. sameness. Same. Dignity in sameness. So that's exactly right, is you can get it the other way. There's really no difference between whales and pandas and people, because we're all really the same. So we are trying to accomplish dignity through sameness instead of dignity through distinction, or union through distinction, yes? Uh -huh. I do. I do. You know, it operates on multiple levels. I'm just going to dodge that because it will take us. But, but I appreciate you asking it because you can see it's not so simple, is it? Right? I mean, I mean, we can spout all this out, but actually trying to see what its implications are is difficult. 
And that takes in a whole lot of other uh, aspects. But again, I think it's really important to see if we pay a woman the same as a man, does that mean that she's now equal? We have to look at, well, what does equality mean? And now we're talking about a different kind of equality. We're talking about economic equality. Absolutely, it does. It absolutely does fall. And so this is the challenge: is we have principles, and now the principles have to be applied. This is the definition of wisdom. Wisdom is being able to know what the principle is. What is the telos? The telos is honoring and respecting human dignity. And now the challenge is: how do you do that practically? These are great questions. And I like you bringing that up because it shows how theology of the body has application where? Everything. Because faith is a light capable of illuminating every aspect of human existence. All right, so, OK. Where do we see this reductionistic language in our culture? Really quickly. Think abortion. We don't call a baby in the womb anymore baby. What do we call it? A fetus, reduce it even more. Tissue. Tissue. What else? A clump of shell. Cells. Sorry. Clump. A, a blob. What did you say? That's right. An it. A choice. Can you hear the reductionistic language? An it. My choice. A clump of cells. A product of conception. A disease. In some places, Pregnancy is considered a disease. If I have a clump of cells on my arm and I don't want it anymore, what do I do with it? I get rid of it. If I have a clump of cells here and I don't want it anymore, what do I do with it? I get rid of it. Do you see how important language is? It's really, really important. All right, think for a moment about, I'm sorry, don't think about pornography. Okay, think about what happens in pornography. Okay, so when a man buys a pornographic magazine, or now all he has to do, right, is just, you know, open up the browser on his cell phone. Or a woman. Or a woman, thank you. It's unfortunately now uh, crossing over. It's into the feminine arena as well. But for a moment, I just want to use the example of a man, since that is more common. But I really appreciate that. It's important to be reminded. Okay, so when a man's looking at a pornographic uh, image of a woman, is he saying, oh, my, how her body reveals God. I know. The express purpose of pornography is to take and reduce the woman down to her physical dimension. If he really saw her as a, as a person, he wouldn't be able to look at her in a pornographic way. See, this is the express purpose of pornography, is to take and reduce the woman down to an object. This is why pornography is so, so destructive. Because it's forming men and women, although the reason women use pornography is a bit different. But it is forming lots and lots of men. It's not harmless, right? That's what said, well, I'm not hurting anyone. Really? They're hurting themselves. They're hurting every woman that they will interact with because they are training themselves how to approach the body of a woman as merely an object for enjoyment. What did I do with my candy bar, right? She's just eye candy. That's all she becomes. What I love about theology of the body is we can address some very difficult issues, the issues that sometimes it's hard for us to know how to talk about. And one of those issues is masturbation. If you are masturbating, whose body is being reduced down to an object? Your own. Your own. You're reducing your own body down to an object. See, God is smart. He knows that that experience is pleasurable. He knows the experience of sexual re release is pleasurable. And so he has a design for it. His design is that when you experience that rush of pleasure, it's meant to bond you with the person you're experiencing it with. If you're masturbating, who are you bonding with? Yourself. yourself. Do you see how destructive? It is, and yet our young men in particular, and again, this is another one that has crept over into feminine culture as well. They're being told, you know what, it's harmless, right? You're not harming anyone. I think many of our young men think, oh, it's not a big deal. You know, I'll masturbate while I'm in high school and college, and then I'll get married and it'll go away. Really? You are training yourself, your body, 
to seek release on demand. And so what's going to happen? You know, you get married, and let's say your wife is sick. Let's say she develops cancer, and you're in your 30s. What are you going to do? Oh, it's OK, honey. I'll just take care of it myself. So this is very, very destructive. And I think it's important we learn how to speak on it. Now, notice I didn't start out yesterday evening by saying, welcome to this workshop on theology of the body and new evangelization. Let's talk about masturbation. Do you see how important it is to set the context? So I, I think it's important that we learn how to speak about these things, but always in reverence and always being aware of our audience. Because it's important, our first responsibility as catechists is to protect the innocence of those that we catechize and to support, not replace, parents. So I really think it's important, especially when we're speaking about sexual issues and areas that we're very cautious and just to be careful about what we introduce and to not introduce it too early. This is the difficulty when you have a variety of ages that you're catechizing. So I would just offer that caution. Yes? And the other thing that they're determining too is that because of that behavior, they're actually changing the sexual expression of what release means. And so they don't even, a lot of people aren't satisfied with their wife. Uh, right, because it, right, pornography does, right, pornography and masturbation do the same thing, is exactly. So, so it changes the meaning. What's the meaning of masturbation? Me. That's the meaning. What's the meaning of the beautiful act of love between a husband and wife? Other. Total self-gift to the other. So that there is a we that's created. The meaning of conjugal love is we, not I. Very, very key distinction. Thank you for bringing that out. All right, so let's move on. John Paul II, in the remaining part of this panel, 2A, looks at the understanding of adultery in the Old Testament and how Jesus shifts the understanding of adultery from a merely physical act to an act of the heart, an interior act. And then he's going to do a classic spiral. He's going to spiral back to lustful desire, to concupiscence as a reduction. In audience 43, he says, the concupiscence that arises as an interior act changes the very intentionality of the woman's existence for the man by reducing the wealth of the perennial call to the communion of persons. Perennial call. Perennial means always, constant. What's the call between a man and woman? What does he say? The communion of persons. So reducing, there's that reductionistic language, the wealth of the perennial call to the communion of persons, the wealth of the deep attraction of masculinity and femininity to the mere satisfaction of the body's sexual urge. I have an impulse. I act on it, I meet it, I'm done. Such a reduction has the effect that the person, in this case the woman, becomes for the other person, the man, above all an object for the possible satisfaction of his own sexual urge. Wow, huh? He calls a spade a spade, doesn't he? That this is what's happening. Welcome to American college culture. It's so destructive. We are teaching, giving permission to our young people to create a culture exactly this, where each person is seen as an object of potential enjoyment to satisfy my sexual urge. So let's summarize what we've done so far in panel 2A. What audience number was that? Oh, that was audience 43. Did I take it out of your workbook? Oh, OK, that's because, you know, I knew I was getting too long-winded, so I took it out. But it's a great audience. Uh, it's a great quote. Audience 43, section number 3. It starts with the concupiscence that arises as an interior act. So as Christians in the world, this is what we confront every day, right? Because we're not taken out of the culture. As laity, our call is not to evacuate the culture, right? When there's a disaster, what are you told to do? Get out! Evacuate! Is our culture in a disaster? Yeah. Is our call as Christians to get out? Evacuate! No, Vatican II says, jump in. 
That's tough. Do you see why we need one another? We can't do this alone. We are called to transform society and culture from within Vatican II says. This is the specific call of the laity. We have a huge, huge mission. And theology of the body, again, it's like giving us this whole arsenal, this whole set of tools to be able to jump in in a new way and not drown, but instead be a life preserver, literally, for people. I like to think of ourselves as buoys. How many people do you know are going under? We need to be a buoy that other people can grab onto and we can lift them up and hold them up. So let's read the last paragraph that summarizes all of this. This civilization of use, it's what John Paul II calls this result of original sin, how it's infected and permeated our culture so that we, we look at each other's, other as potential objects of use. So this civilization of use is incapable of promoting the communion of persons because it has lost the interior freedom of the gift. Our default mode, so when you turn the computer on, it comes up in its default mode. It's just what is. That, so we have the same thing in our culture. Our default mode is to view ourselves and others in just the physical dimension as potential objects of enjoyment, as constituted primarily by our biological impulses, right? We are just biology. And ignore the spiritual reality of the human person as well as the real significance of the body, which is to image God in the world through union and communion through a sincere gift of self. Do you think that is somewhat an adequate image of our culture? So it's what we already started looking at last night, those five characteristics. Now what are we doing? We're filling that out of how we practically bump up against this every day. And where did you read that from? That was already in the book? No, that was my own summary. That should be in your workbook. Yeah, yeah it's at the top of page 2.5. Yeah. Right side of the top. You started on the bottom. You started off, this civilization of use is incapable of promoting the communion of persons because it has lost an adequate understanding of blank. Oh, so yeah. OK, let me see. What do we, what, let me see. Let me see what I have here. It's lost an adequate understanding of the interior freedom of the gift. Of the human person and the body being sacramental. Really, of all those five characteristics of the invisible and the visible, of created reality having a sacramental dimension, of God being involved in the world, of salvation being spousal or nuptial, of freedom being the freedom to give myself away. So all you have to do is go back, if I could use it, to your blue page and fill in those five characteristics of a sacramental worldview. That's what goes in that, that blank. Our culture has lost, because it used to be I didn't give people that blue cheat sheet. <laughs> so our culture has lost that, and as a result, we have this civilization of use. So thank you. Uh, so fortunately, that's not the end of the Theology of the Body workshop. It'd be a real bummer if I said, thank you very much for coming. <laughs> right? What a down note to end on. Instead, we know that now we'll have the privilege of looking at panel 2B. Woohoo! What's panel 2B? It's the human person redeemed in Christ. In other words, how the redemption of Christ purifies our heart, our interior, because this is where sin works to affect us. Why? So that we recover the spousal me of the body, the physical dimension and the spiritual reality, in all the fullness of its truth and beauty, as the human body was designed to be, made in the image and likeness of a Trinitarian God. Yes? So catechesis really doesn't cross 2A, 2B. It does not. But it's kind of a long word, right? I actually, I'm going to erase it because I like for you to have to remember the keywords instead of having. That's why you write them in the inside of your thing.